Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. Here at GC Church, we are all about putting God's truth into action and we pray that you do just that, taking His word and truth and walking it out in your faith journey. If you're not a member of a local body, we invite you to connect with us. Simply visit gcchurch.tv or join our online campus by texting the word online to 615-488-7151. So grab your Bibles, your pen, and let's dig into the word of God together. Um, you may have noticed when you came in today, there was a table out in the lobby, and um, it says, come grow with us, I believe. It is a Generation Changers Academy opportunity for people to sign up uh, to become part of the team. We literally, in one location alone, have a 95-kid wait list to get into Generation Changers Academy. And there's uh, even uh, more here at this location and the one thing that keeps us from being able to get them here quicker is that we need more dedicated people who love God, who have a heart to, to share Jesus with the next generation. So if you have a high school diploma, that is the qualification. Beyond that, you need to love Jesus and not hate children, okay? And uh, we would, uh, if, you, if you've got time on your hands and, and want to uh, get to work helping us minister to the next generation, they want to talk with you. Make sure to drop by and see Miss Kelly and her beautiful little baby boy out there. How can you say no to him? Well, we are approaching the celebration of the birth of Jesus. And we must remember that we're not just celebrating some random act that took place 2,000 years ago. We are celebrating the most important event in human history. As a matter of fact, Christmas was put into motion before the world was created. It was decided that Jesus would come and be the Lamb of God. And God so wanted us not to miss the arrival of Jesus that throughout the Old Testament, he flashed sign after sign, word after word, thing after thing to point us to the fact that Jesus was coming in the form of man. It's kind of like something I do, and I must confess to you that when I'm driving down the highway and I run across maybe a, a, a policeman that's kind of hidden and he's running radar. I flash my lights at people for about a mile because I, I won't, don't want them to run their day and get a ticket, right? Or, or if there's some accident on the road, some of you are looking at me like I'm a criminal now. Just arrest me then, okay? Um, but I don't want people to get a ticket. But if there's an accident or an animal on the road, you do the same thing. You, you flash those lights to get people's attention saying, don't miss what's ahead of you. And that's exactly what God did throughout the Old Testament as he spoke to us in prophetic words about the coming of Jesus. It's said that Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies in his lifetime. Many of them were fulfilled simply by him being born. The chances of him meeting all of these prophecies, fulfilling just a portion of them, would be impossible except God was in control and Jesus was of divine nature, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. Now, it's easy to get caught up in the celebration of dear Lord baby Jesus, right? And sometimes we miss the importance of his coming, how he fulfilled the promise and plan of God for all of the ages. And it's also easy to forget the cost of Christmas to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Today, I want to look at three prophecies that were fulfilled with Jesus coming in and point out that God's plan sometimes comes at a cost to those who participate in them. We're going to see how the plan of God unfolded for the birth of Jesus and I believe in the process, we're going to discover how the plan of God sometimes unfolds in our lives. The first prophecy I want to visit today is the one of the virgin birth. Now, many people automatically jump right to the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament to talk about the fact that 700 years before Jesus was born, this perfect prophecy of the virgin birth was given. The Bible says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now that's powerful to think that 700 years before the birth of Jesus, 
it was perfectly prophesied that he would be born of the Virgin Mary. But this is not the first time that was promised. You have to go back 700 more years, 1,400 years before the birth of Jesus in the book of Genesis as they were recording events that took place long before that 1,400 years before Jesus came. It's in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3 at the fall of man when Satan deceived man and man ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in, in disobedience to the word of the Lord. And God begins to come and rectify this problem, but before he ever deals with the people who were involved, he deals with the enemy that deceived him. And here's what he said. But I will put enmity between you, that's hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now, it's interesting that God says the woman's seed because woman does not produce a seed, she receives a seed in childbearing. It takes the involvement of a man. However, in this perfect prophecy, the first promise we have of Jesus coming, it is so neat that God got it exactly right telling us that in this event, man would not be involved, but this would be a divine seed received by the virgin womb of Mary. Now, fast forward 1,400 years after that was written in the book of Luke, and you'll see a young teenage virgin by the name of Mary. And the angel of the Lord appears to her and tells her she's going to have a son, and he would be the son of the Most High God, and he would establish a kingdom that would never end. That's powerful. Now, questioning this impossibility, she says, how can this be as I've not known a man? I've not had any kind of relationship with a man. And the angel begins to give her a perfect description. He said, the Holy Spirit is going to come on you and the, on the shadow of the Almighty, he's going to overshadow you and you're going to conceive a son. Now, unable to grasp all of the gravity of the situation, I love Mary's response. She says this, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. In this prophecy of the virgin birth, here's the first lesson I learned. God doesn't need our help, just our surrender. Sometimes when we see God's plan begin to unfold in our life, surrender is more important than skill. We simply have to say yes to the plan that God has for us. What God would do through Mary was greater than she could possibly know at that moment. The seed of Christ inside of her would one day save the world. I want you to think about God's plan for your life for a moment. If you are a Jesus follower, the seed of Christ has been planted in you. And that seed carries more potential to impact the world than you can imagine. He has a similar plan to let the Christ in you touch the world. But there's an unwritten dynamic for Mary. See, she's a teenage girl somewhere around the age of 16. She's engaged to be married, and she's pregnant. This lets me know that God's favor doesn't always meet with man's approval. Follow me now. I'll suggest that everybody in the culture did not readily embrace her story, I am conceived of the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, there would be a lot of doubt cast on that. There would be a lot of people who would just assume that Mary was promiscuous and had gotten pregnant out of wedlock. And in that culture, much more so than today, there was great shame that came with the promise that she carried. So much so that her husband Joseph even considered putting her away, divorcing her privately to spare her the public humiliation. Listen to me now. Don't make the mistake of assuming that everyone will buy in to God's plan for your life. That's a good place to say amen. Favor with God does not always translate into favor with man. 
But when you have divine favor, don't worry about public opinion. Oh, wow. But (laughs) sometimes the cost of favor can be great, but the reward will be greater. Not everybody may believe what God is doing in you and what God wants to do through you. Not everybody will understand you. Matter of fact, some people will misunderstand you, and as a result, they will mistreat you. But it doesn't matter what the culture says about you. When you have the favor of God, you don't need the approval of man. Can I get a witness from somebody here today? But understand that this great plan God was working in her life came at a cost to her. She had to put up with the haters and the naysayers, and so do we. Here's the second prophecy I believe that was costly, and that's the Bethlehem trip. Now get this, Mary was nearly nine months pregnant when Caesar Augustus decided to tax the known Roman world. And because of the census he would take to collect the tax, every person had to go back to their home city where they came from as a result. Let's read. So Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David. He's tracing the steps, okay, because he belonged to the house and line of David. That was another prophecy being fulfilled that Jesus would be born of the lineage of David. Now watch this. We sing songs like um, (laughs) Silent Night and Away in a Manger, and we get the warm fuzzies, and we don't really realize all that took place. There was a reason for this journey. 700 years prior, the prophet Micah had prophesied that the Messiah, Jesus, would be born in the town of Bethlehem of Judea. Watch this. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. In other words, his origin is going to be in God the Father, who existed before time. And Micah, uh, uh, he, he perfectly prophesies where Jesus is going to be born. But the problem is, Mary was pregnant in Nazareth. She had a promise in Bethlehem, but she had to get from Nazareth in Galilee before that promise could be realized. Think about it. As we sing the silent night and we think of all the peace, we forget that she was nine months pregnant, traveling via donkey for 90 miles at the most 20 miles per day. So she's making a four and a half day journey, riding a donkey, carrying provisions. They were going through the cold desert nights, crossing over the hillsides and mountains. It was not an easy journey. At nighttime, they faced the threat of predators and even robbers and thieves. They weathered so much on this journey that we never even think about. We just think about Jesus being born in Bethlehem. We forget that somebody had to pay the cost to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. (laughs) Hear me. Their journey wasn't easy, and sometimes ours isn't either. We have a promise in Bethlehem, but we're camping out in Nazareth. And God then begins through a series of of events to move us and position us perfectly for the promise we are to inherit. We have to remember that that journey can be difficult, but keep in mind your difficulty is about your destiny. Hear me now. What you're going through is about where you're going to. There was a specific promise she carried in her womb that led her through difficulty to see it come to pass. See, if I understand something, most of the time that we go through difficulty, we have such a, such a wrong picture of God that we think he's punishing us for our past. Well, I did something to deserve this. If I understand correctly, Jesus paid the punishment for my past. God punished his own son for what's behind me. So if I go through difficulty today, it's not about the punishment of my past. It's about the preparation for my future. 
My difficulty has to do with my development for my destiny. Come on now, somebody. When you're going through something, it's easy to get wrapped up in what you're going through and forget where you're headed to. I am sure that about two and a half days into that arduous journey, Mary had to hold on to the word of God from the angel. And sometimes all you can do with the circumstances around you is hold on to you know what God has spoken to you. You have to hold on to the promise of God over your life. You have to hold on to the belief that there's a divine purpose that you are to fulfill and what you are going through today is not going to be the end of you. It's just a period of transition to get you to where God wants you to be. She was in difficulty, but the angel still said, you're blessed and highly favored among women. (laughs) How hard is it to remember that when we are going through difficulty, God still says we are blessed and highly favored. How difficult is it to remember that those circumstances are falling around around us, that there's the promise of God within inside of us, and we can't lose the joy of what's on the inside because of the circumstances on the outside. Wow. You say, well, I know God's got a great plan for my life. He, he wants to do something in me and through me. Why am I going through this divorce? This is a big one a lot of ministers go through. I know that God's got something for me and something great, but why am I sick? A number of people who have been used greatly to preach the gospel have gone through life-threatening illnesses at one point in their life. Why am I going through this? I'm called of God, but why am I struggling financially right now? Why am I going through my difficult, this is too difficult, I can't make it. What if Mary had got about three days into the journey with a day and a half to go and said, this is just too hard, I can't go on? If she had a, the destiny of the seed that she carried would have been aborted because we we find that Jesus had to perfectly fulfill all the prophecies about his birth and there was a word that he would be born in Bethlehem. Listen, I, I, I don't know exactly what you're going through, but don't abort your destiny in the middle of your difficulty. Hear me. Keep your eyes on the prize. Know that God's placed a seed in you. Realize God has a purpose for you. Realize there's a word over your life. And no matter what you're going through today, you're going to make it to Bethlehem. Did you hear what I said? No matter where you are in your journey, you're going to land right where God wants you to land. Be right where he wants you to be. And God's going to do exactly what he said he could do. Come on, give God some big praise in this room. Your destiny is on the other side of your difficulty. You got time for one more prophecy? This is a good one, and it's one that we often overlook because it actually takes place as Jesus begins to grow as a child, and that is the exile in Egypt. See, there were magi, or we call them wise men, and they were from Persia, India, and Arabia, and they saw a sign in the heavens, a a star in the east, if you will, and they believed that star was leading them to worship a newborn king. So they began to set out and following this star. And they got to King Herod, and they said, where is this new baby that's born king of the Jews? If there's one thing you don't talk about to the old king, it's the new king. (laughs) You don't call up your ex and tell him how great your present husband is. (laughs) You just don't do that kind of stuff. It creates issues, and it did for Herod. As a matter of fact, it did for all of Jerusalem. So Herod hatched a plot. He told the wise man, go and worship him, and when you find him, come back and tell me so I too can go and worship him. He had no intention of worshiping this baby. His intention was to kill this baby so his throne would not have to be vacated. He didn't understand the big plan that God had in place. So the three wise men get to where Jesus were, and they brought him three gifts, right? Gold, Frankenstein, and myrrh. No, frankincense. I was just seeing if you knew your Bible. They bring gifts to worship Jesus, and then they're warned by the Lord in a dream, do not return to Herod. So the Bible says they each return to their own country. Now watch this. Herod then says, if I can't find him, 
I'll get him by the mass slaughter of all male children under the age of two that's been born in the region of Bethlehem. He was willing to wipe out all of the children under two that were male in order to try to kill the seed of Christ. And watch this. When they had gone up, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Now, Matthew in this, in this account references the prophecy of Hosea in the Old Testament in Hosea 11 and 1. When Israel was a young nation, I loved them. I chose to bring my son out of Egypt. Now, watch this. While Hosea may not have knowingly been giving a messianic prophecy and may have been simply referring to the fact that Israel as a young nation had been brought out of captivity, God was working a grander plan and he was trying to emphasize to the world that Jesus was the fulfillment of the freedom that he brought his children out of Egypt to experience. He brought them out of Egypt so that one day they could encounter Jesus. Hmm. It's exactly what God does for us. He calls us out of, his, out of our bondage to sin to experience the lordship of his son. But what about the impact on Mary, Joseph, and Jesus? It must have been hard to flee, especially to Egypt. See, Jesus came first to the house of Israel. Salvation was first to the Jews, then, then to the Gentiles. So we have the very people he came to save rejecting him. Wouldn't be the last time they would reject him when he was standing trial before Pilate. They would cry, crucify him and let go a common criminal. But in this, can, can you imagine the rejection that must have been experienced? Mary knew what God had said. He's going to be the savior of his people. He's going to be the king over Israel forever. And, and when, you, when she begins to ponder this now, they have to flee the very people that Jesus came to redeem. The rejection must have been horrible. But here's the lesson, my friend, for us. Rejection may just be God's protection. God was only hiding them out for a season and a reason. Hear me, for a season and a reason. I, I just feel like telling somebody here today, you're in a season for a reason. He was protecting the child who would grow to be the man who would die as the Lamb of God for the sins of the world. Hear me now. I'm sure they felt a little bit displaced and a whole lot rejected. And some of you in this place and some of you watching via internet today, you may feel that same rejection. You may feel that same sense of being displaced. But understand something. God may just be hiding you from what could hinder you. This rejection you feel, this obscurity you're in, you feel like you're overlooked and out of place. God may have put you right there in that place because he's working something for your good. If you feel like things are a little off track and you're a little out of place, I want you to rest in the divine care of the loving Father. You are just in witness protection. He's hiding you for a season for a reason. <laughs> What's this? And God dealt with the enemies of Christ while he put Christ in hiding. i got to stay right there a minute. While you are feeling overlooked, you may just be in hiding while God deals with the things that could destroy you. You needn't to think that the devil is going to assist you in your God-given destiny. He's designed people and he's designed circumstances to keep you from becoming everything God wants you to be. And if you're feeling like your life's just kind of sitting still for a little bit and nothing's happening and you're feeling overlooked, God is covering you with his wing while he deals with the hindrances in your life that could destroy you. Because you could be out there fighting against them and spend the rest of your life fighting your demons rather than living your purpose. Pastor, I'm a good girl. I believe God wants me to be married and have a family. What's wrong with me? Ain't nothing wrong with you. He's just hiding you from the wrong one. Pastor, I'm a good guy. 
I know that God wants me to be a husband and a father. Why is it taking so long? Why am I, why am I just being overlooked by everybody? You know why? Because they might be there to hinder you, not to help you, and God's having to hide you from the one that would hinder you so he can bring the one that will help you into your life. Pastor, I believe there's great things for me to do. Why is nothing happening? Because God is removing the obstacles that could one day trip you up. And while you are there in hiding, you rest in the peace of God and let God fight for you. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? The battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. So if you're feeling a little bit obscure and a little bit out of place, know that God is battling your enemies for you. And by the way, this obscurity you are in, that's the incubator of destiny. Because while God's doing some things for you, he's doing other things in you. And the short period that Jesus was in Egypt, there were things that he, God was doing in him to mature him as the child, to become the man, to die as the lamb. Watch this. After Herod died, man, you know what that tells me? Herod was the one that riled up all of Jerusalem to kill Jesus. There is no extent that God will not go to to see his plan fulfilled in your life. And if God be for you, <laughs> it don't matter if the king's against you. Oh, I've done preached up on something. Y'all should, if y'all don't like extra stuff, y'all should come to the early service. We got a lot less time. Oh. Uh, it don't matter if the Congress is against you. It don't matter if the White House is making policy against you. It doesn't matter if all the cool kids in school are against you. It don't matter if the, if the teacher hates you and wants to see you fail. It doesn't matter if your boss is giving you a hard time and doesn't see the greatness in you. When God is for you, the king himself is no match for the hand of God. <laughs> After Herod died, the angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But watch, God still directed. But when they heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Nazareth, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. Understand something, while God was defeating his enemies, he was also working on his destiny. God did not forget about Jesus, but notice if you look back up, he told Joseph to stay there until he told him to leave. <laughs> That's the hard part, staying where God tells you to be until the time for him to call you out. Being faithful where you are before you stand into who you are. <laughs> God did not forget about them. And hear me, I have a word of God for you today. God has not forgotten about you. He knows where he's been hiding you. He realizes the obscurity. He realizes feeling overlooked. He knows all of that. But just keep resting in the Lord and trusting in his time. Because just like God called Joseph to bring Jesus to Israel, get this, God's going to call you out of your obscurity into your place of purpose in Jesus' name. Now, it's interesting that Jesus had to flee to Egypt because this is, there are so many rabbits that are dying today. I'm just telling you because I'm going rabbit trail after rabbit trail. But it's interesting he had to go to Egypt. It really is. Egypt was the most infamous place of Israel's captivity. It was the most infamous place of their bondage. And God so perfectly designed my freedom he so perfectly designed the sacrifice of Jesus that he sent his son to the place of his people's bondage so that when he went to the cross, he would take that bondage with him and they would be free. God loved me so much that he sent his only son to die for my sins. But before he went to the cross, he stepped into my bondage. He stepped into what took my freedom. He stepped into my chains. He stepped into the place that had me bound. 
he faced the powers I faced that overcame me. And when he went to the cross, uh, he took every bit of that stuff with him. And now he who the Son sets free is free indeed because he walked in and out of your bondage, took it to Calvary. And today you are free because Jesus did that. <laughs> So sometimes we feel displaced. Sometimes we feel forgotten or disconnected. Sometimes we feel rejected. When all the time, God is weaving his master plan to release the seed of Christ he's placed in us into the world to impact the world for the kingdom of God. The Jesus in you, God has plans for. And it doesn't matter where you find yourself today. God has a plan for your life. It won't always be easy, but it will always be amazing. <laughs> I'm not telling you that getting destiny from the inside of you to the outside is going to be an easy process. But I am telling you it's going to be an amazing process. You know, there's a little boy in the Polar Express. I don't even know that the movie even names the kid. But he has this silent but very integral part. He has a Christmas bell like the kids were ringing earlier. And he keeps ringing it, but he can't hear it. It's not impacting him because he doesn't believe. And he's not able to enjoy the sound of the bell until he says these words, I believe. I wish Hollywood were as concerned with us believing in Jesus as they are Santa Claus, but he didn't have the joy of the sound until he made up his mind to believe. This message is like that ringing bell. You can't receive the joy of it until you truly believe in your heart that God loves you so much he sent his son for your salvation and with your salvation came a redemptive plan to take your life that was going to be wasted on all the things that you wanted, and now it's going to be invested for all the things that God wanted. You simply have to believe. But remember, in the plan, God don't need your help. He just needs your surrender. I'm the kind of guy that likes to help God out. He tells me, I'm going to do this, and then I bring him a three-point plan with a poem. And God goes, Barry, when are you going to learn? I don't need your help. I just want your surrender. Because the thing is, he doesn't give us all the plan at one time. He told Mary that her child was going to save him from their sins, but I bet she didn't think about the cross. I bet she didn't think about all the details. She just knew God had a plan. Listen, you don't have to know all the details. You just need to say yes to God. So today, during this Christmas season, and by the way, it's not over after today. There's plenty more to come all the way through Christmas Eve. Even the Sunday after Christmas, we're going to be celebrating. But I want to tell you this. Today, I believe God wants us to pray a prayer of surrender that will absolutely change the course of our lives. And if you're ready to say yes to what God has for you, to trust God's timing, to follow God's plan. I just want you to bow your heads with me and would you just repeat this prayer with me? Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus for my redemption. Today, I surrender to his lordship and to your plan for my life because I know in Christ, I am truly blessed. I am highly favored. I am deeply loved. And the seed of Jesus that lives in me is going to touch the world for the glory of God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. One more time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and we pray that this message has impacted your life and encouraged you. And if you're not a member of a local body, we encourage you to connect with us by visiting gcchurch.tv or join our online campus by texting the word online to 615 615- 
488-7151. And remember one last thing, God loves you and so does GC Church.